Thanks for watching today at wildwoodchurch.com. Now here's today's message. Good morning. Please turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4 will be in verses 18 to 25 this morning. Um, Welcome, my name is Matt Winkwist. I'm an elder and the discipleship pastor uh, here on staff at Wildwood Church. Uh, Glad you're here, Um, as has become my custom uh, and my preference. Uh, I'm going to to ask you to to pray out loud in a moment. And uh, out loud is is my strong preference. Um, I love hearing the prayers of the saints out loud together. And I'd I'd ask that you pray for me, that the Holy Spirit would speak through me, and um, that I would proclaim God's word accurately, because it's his word, not mine. And I would ask that you would pray for yourselves and for me, that we would all hear Believe, understand, and obey God's word together. All right, and so I'm gonna give you about a minute to do that, and I will close that uh, particular portion uh, with prayer myself here in a minute. So, and go. And Father, we thank you. Thank you for the prayers of your saints, but thank you more that you hear them. Uh, That even if people were to continue praying right now, they would hear me and you, or and them at the same time, that you would, and that you can hear and answer those prayers, God. And I pray that you would do that, Lord, that you would you would open our eyes to understand your word, help me to understand it well enough to communicate it, and for us to understand it well enough to hear it, believe it, and obey it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. I appreciate you cooperating with me on that. I know it's weird here in American culture, but someday it's going gonna, it's gonna to be good. It's going to be awesome because, and here's the thing, like we're talking about revival happening all across the land, right? Uh, you can hear it in our singing now, and someday we're going to hear it in our praying too. Like re- true revival is only going to happen through a work of the Spirit. And how do we know that that is going to happen? It's through the prayers of his saints. And so... Um, I love that you pray for me and for us before we get started. Anyway, today we are going to be in Romans chapter 4, verses 18 to 25. Um, And you're going to notice right off the bat, it says, in hope he believed against hope. Hope is a major theme that we're going to deal with. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about hope this morning. It's helpful as we get started to understand what we mean when we say the word hope, right? Because... um, Biblical hope is not the same as the word hope that we normally use in, in our society in this day and age. All right. Normally, we use the normal use for hope. When we talk about hope, we're saying something that is good, that we wish for, a good outcome that we hope will happen, that we wish would happen, but we're not necessarily certain of it. That is not biblical hope. I'll give you an example of what I mean by this. And so, and to start out with, know that whenever I tell a story about a family member that could in some way negatively reflect on them, I ask their permission first, and they have veto power. If they say no, no means no, and I won't, I won't share it. Mia has given me permission to share the story. It's somewhat, it's somewhat humorous, um, but can uh, be uh, construed in a negative light if you choose to do so. Um, anyway, so when you're, when you're raising your children, you say things like, I hope that my children learn some of the positive lessons and automatically pick up on good and right ways of living. Uh, One of those examples played itself out in uh, me teaching Mia how to drive. She has her license now. She's a very good driver um, and whatnot. But while we were teaching her how to drive, I, I feel like I was fairly patient, but I would say things like, you know, Mia, you need to do this, or you need to do that, watch for this. Hey, I uh, see the brake lights up there, you need to slow down. I uh, flit off the, you know, I constantly reminded her of stuff, and she was picking up on it well, um, as she does pretty much everything in life. However, I was noticing that 
like I was always having to tell her, you, you need to stop. Like this is, this is uh, we're, we're in danger zone, right? Um, and so I said, the thing that's gonna get you to the next level of being just, not just a, an acceptable driver, but a competent one and a smooth one is being able to recognize what's up the road ahead of you and, um, and, and, and namely brake lights. You need to be able to see <laughs> brake lights up ahead before I do three sec and say something three seconds after I've actually noticed them. And finally, and this is about a month into uh, teaching her how to drive, she goes, Dad, what are brake lights? <laughs> While we're driving. And I'm like, okay. And so I had hoped that in the 16 years that she rode along with me in the car, that it just sort of automatically made sense that when the bright red lights flash every time people in front of you stop, that that meant the cars were... But alas, it was not a certain hope. It was wishful thinking. Um, and my dad, uh, who will be here in the second service, can tell you some stories about me teaching me how to drive as well. Um, and in fact, Mia already has many more driving hours under her belt than I did uh, before my first accident. So um, <laughs> there, <laughs> there's, a, there's that. Um, in fact, I crashed into a parked car in a Burger King parking lot um, and had to go to literally every single person in the restaurant and ask, do you own a green Pontiac? <laughs> the last person was like, uh, yes. Uh, anyway, that's free chicken, as Brian says. Um, anyway, hope is not wishful thinking in the Bible. And uh, we're going we're gonna to jump right into the passage, and then we're going to talk about what biblical hope actually is. Verse 18 of Romans chapter 4 says, In hope he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations, as he had been told. So shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, since he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. I want you to notice a few general things before we dig in a little bit deeper about this particular section. Uh, it says, uh, first, I want you to notice that hope and belief or faith are interwoven and closely related. They're not the same thing, but they are closely related. We'll unpack that a little bit as we go. Second, I want you to notice that Abraham's hope was based upon what he had been told by God. It says, as he had been told so shall your offspring be, in verse 18. Third, I want you to notice that hope was not dependent upon the circumstances. Brian has already unpacked this, and so we're not going to go into any great detail on it, but um, the circumstances were bad for Abraham, right? He was 100, his, his wife was 90, and that alone should tell you it's not possible to have a kid. The circumstance, God, God, our reason for hope is not dependent upon the circumstances. The same is true in our lives. All right, so now with those basic, basic framework in, I want to look at what exactly is hope? What is biblical hope? What does the Bible say hope is? This, isn't the, first, this is the first time that hope is mentioned in, in Romans. It won't be the last. Um, but what does the Bible say hope is? I'm going to give you five things. There's, there's more than five things, but I'm going to give you five things this morning that are major things that hope are. The first one is hope is something that we wait for expectantly or earnestly. Um, Galatians 5.5 5 tells us this. It says, for through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. Now, this idea of eagerly waiting, it could also be expectant waiting. Just think about anything that you're looking forward to, any event that you're excited about, that you've got on your calendar, you circle it on your calendar. You wait for it expectantly because you know as long as the Lord tarries, you're going to go do that because you're excited about it. You're waiting for it. That's the, what, what it means in Galatians 5, 5 when it says, eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. We're waiting for it expectantly. Romans chapter 8, 19 through to 21 says this, for the creation waits with eager, eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from the bondage of corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. I want you to notice that here in verse 19, you have the word 
waits, verse 20, in hope. All right, wait and hope are seen together. It goes on to, to, to explain this even more in verses 23 to 25. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons. Anybody else's word, it leads us to the fourth thing that hope is. Hope is dependent upon God's unchangeable character. Hope is dependent upon God's unchangeable character. Lamentations chapter 3, verses 22 to 24, if anybody had a reason to complain about the way life was going, it was Jeremiah who wrote Lamentations. He would preach what God told him to preach, and it fell upon deaf ears. They never listened. In fact, in the end, he died for preaching God's word, uh, a gruesome death. And, and yet, towards the end of his life, through all this, he says, in verse 22 of Lamentations 3, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him, right? Our hope is based on God's unchangeable character. Jeremiah says, the Lord is my portion, and my hope is in him. We go to Hebrews chapter 6, verses 13 to 20. Uh, the author of Hebrews is dealing with the exact same story that, uh, that Paul is dealing with in Romans chapter 4. Uh, Abraham and Sarah and the birth of their child. And this is what it says in verse six, chapter 6, verse 13 of Hebrews. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swore, swear, he swore by who? Himself. He swore by himself. Huh. Since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise 
For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes, an oath is final confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise, the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. So that by two unchangeable things, let's stop there for a second, what are the unchangeable, two unchangeable things he's talking about? He's talking about his person and his word, his character and his word. So but two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor for the soul. What is that steadfast anchor for a soul? Hope. A hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain. What is that hope that enters into the place behind the curtain? It's not a what, it's a who where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. All right, our, our hope is certain. We, we, we uh, wait expectantly for our hope because of its certainty, and, and it is certain because it depends on God's promises, and God's promises are certain because of God's character, and we can hope our, that, and, and for those reasons alone, our hope is certain. Right? And that leads to the fifth and final thing that is very much related. That fifth and final thing is that hope is something that only the righteous have. Hope is something that only the righteous have. Proverbs 11 verse 7 says, When the wicked dies, his hope will perish, and the expectation of wealth perishes too. That should be a somber warning for every single one of us because we've already read in Romans all along the way Paul has convincingly shown us that we are born in sin. Um, no one is righteous, no not one. And uh, Romans 3.10, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We start out as wicked. And so the message that Paul is proclaiming here when he's talking about hope is one that says, you need God to act on your behalf so that you can be righteous, so that instead of dying without hope in your wickedness, you can die with hope in righteousness. All right? And so, hope is waiting expectantly. It's interwoven with faith because of its certainty. It's dependent upon God's word and his promises, and it's dependent on God's unchangeable character, and it's something that only the righteous have. All right. So what exactly do we hope for? What exactly do we hope for and why aren't these things wishful thinking? All right, we're gonna do a little bit of exercise here. It's gonna require you to talk out loud. Um, and so, but I'm gonna give you the answers. You, I'm gonna tell you what to say. You just have to repeat it back to me like you believe it, okay? All right, so I'm gonna ask, I'm, I'm gonna tell you some things that we hope Question, why are these things certain? Why aren't they just wishful thinking? And I'm going to say reason number one. And reason number, reason number one is because of who God is. All right, so let's practice that one. Reason number one, because of who God is. All right, I think you can do better, but that's pretty good. Um, reason number two is because God's word says so. All right, so let's practice that one. Reason number two. Because God's word says so. All right, reason number one. God is. Reason number two. All right, we're warmed up. All right, so what are some things that the Bible says that we can hope in, that we can know for certain are going to happen? One of those things is eternal life and resurrection from the dead. We believe that one day, even if we die, that someday Jesus will bring us back to life physically and we're going to live with him forever and ever. That seems impossible. But how do we know for certain, how can we hope for certain that, that, that that's going to happen and that's not just wishful thinking? Reason, no, reason number one? Because of who God is. Reason number two? That's right. All right. We also believe that someday we will have freedom from the penalty of sin and from sinning itself. We believe that even in this life we can have freedom from sinning. Why is it that we believe that this is true? Reason number one? Who God is. Reason number two? As God's word says so. All right. We also believe that one day there will be an end to to sorrow and tears. Uh, Jesus says, I'm gonna wipe away every tear from your eyes. 
There will be no more death, mourning or pain, crying or pain. Why is it that we, why is that a certain hope? Why is it not just wishful thinking? Reason number one. Reason number two. All right, and there's a fourth one. There's lots of them. I came up with like a dozen, but I'm only going to give you four. Um, The fourth one that I can think of is the unity of all believers. The unity of all believers. Um, God's word, God's word in in John chapter 17, Jesus tells us, or he prays, he's praying to the Father, and he says that they may all be one, just as you and I are one, so that the world may know your love, and so that they may know that you sent me, right? So, uh, what is, why is it that it is certain that, and not wishful thinking, that that is actually going to happen someday? Reason number one, who God is. Reason number two, all right. And I want to dive into that one just a little bit because, you know, we always, I've, I've been here for five years now and I've been to a lot of different churches um, because we've moved around a lot. And uh, that unity thing always seems to be a struggle because we, we stink at having the same uh, concept of how we ought to do things, right? And there's always, there always just seems to be some level of unrest between believers. And sometimes it feels like it's just easier to give up and move on to greener pastures. Let me tell you, there are no greener pastures. Um, but here's the thing. We know that it is important to Jesus that we be unified as believers around him and his person. How do we know that? Because he prayed for it in the garden, and after he was done praying for it, what did he do? He died for it. He said, it means this much to me that I'm willing to die so that you can be one with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, And so, sometimes I think we move forward in life, and this is just one example but sometimes I think we move forward in life with, oh, it feels hopeless. And so even though God's word promises that to be true, it doesn't seem like it's true in this situation. Believe it. Why is it that we can believe it? Reason number one? Reason number two? Because God says so. That's right. All right. Thank you for participating. That was good. You set a high standard for second service. We're going to move on to verse 20. Keep on going. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. Now, it's interesting here, and Brian did a great job a couple of weeks ago uh, when he said, he said, you either have faith or you don't. There is no... Uh, there's either have saving faith or you don't have saving faith. He also correctly said that that faith can be the size of a mustard seed. It can be a small faith, but you either have faith or you don't. Here, uh, if you read this in, I think, an incorrect way, you can be led to believe that you are not, you don't have saving faith unless you have no distrust. Is that what Paul is saying here? What does the fact, what does it mean by no distrust in verse 20? Does it mean that, he, that Abraham never had doubts or questioned the promise? I want to encourage you by Abraham's own life that he actually did have moments of distrust. All right, if you, if you, if you look at Genesis chapter 17, verse 17 to 20, this is the third time that, uh, that God appeared to Abraham and promised him, you are going to have a child through Sarah about this time next year is what he said in this game. This is 24 years after he had made the original promise. And, and, um, and here, here's what Abraham's response was. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, shall a child be born to a man who's 100 years old? Shall Sarah, who's 90 years old, bear a child? And, um, and Abraham said to God, oh, that Ishmael might live before you. Uh, who's Ishmael? Ishmael is the son of the slave woman that, um, Hagar, or, uh, that Sarah had, and her name was Hagar, Sarah had given him to Abraham as a wife, and Ishmael was Abraham's son. And so Abraham's basically saying here, I know what the promise is, but wouldn't it be easier if you just used the son I already have, even though it's not through Sarah? 
In fact, the whole, whole matter of fact that, that Ishmael is even born is proof that they doubted 13 years earlier and said, well, we'll just help God out in his promise. We believe him, but we're going to help him out. Um, and so I love what God's answer, I love God's answer here and how, how it's recorded in Genesis, uh, verse 19. God said, no. Uh, God said, no. All right. Uh, isn't it great that sometimes God says no to stupid things that we think are better? All right. God said, no. But Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. And that is just what he ended up doing. A 90-year-old woman had a baby that, was, that would end up being who the Son of God was born through that line eventually. Um, what does the fact that, I want to point you out one other thing, it says he grew strong in his faith. What does the fact that Abraham grew strong in his faith point to? It points to the fact that at one time it was smaller than it ended up being in the end, all right? Your faith doesn't have to be full on, full bore faith. In fact, that's my story. On March 27th of this year, I will have, uh, it will be my 40th spiritual birthday. Um, I was saved at the age of five, and, um, and my parents explained to me that night in the choir room of our church that I was a sinner in need of a savior, that Jesus died for my sin and, and rose again, and if I believe in that, that I would have eternal life with him. And that night, I believed that. That's all I understood about the gospel. But Jesus saved me that night. And I have had moments of doubt even up to the, the present day, sometimes Satan puts little doubts in my mind and, and makes me want to disbelieve. I've had moments of distrust, just like Abraham did. But today, I believe the gospel so much more. I have grown so much stronger in my faith than I was when I was five years old. When you look at the trajectory of my life, and I believe that because of God's promises, at the end of my life, I will get to look back and say, I believe him even more at 70, 80, or however long I get to live than I do now at 45, all right? Because my faith isn't going to waver because God is going to keep his promise, all right? That should be encouraging to us, that people like Abraham. I'm gonna give you three more people. Just off the top of my head, there are a bunch. In, like you can literally look at all the heroes of the faith and find this in their story. But Thomas, um, the, 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 the apostle Thomas, he, he, was, uh, he, he saw all the things that Jesus did, all the miracles, raising people from the dead, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but after Jesus died, we call him Doubting Thomas. Like, that's in his name now. He's doubting Thomas. Why is he doubting Thomas? Because he doubted. Like, he had a moment of distrust when he said, unless I see Jesus standing right here in front of me, even though you've seen him, I'm not going to believe it until I get to touch him. All right? Well, and Jesus appeared to him, and then he believed. Peter. Peter saw all the miracles, and he was the one that said, you are the Christ, the Son of God. Right? And upon this rock, Jesus said, I'll build my church. He also said, Jesus, or Peter said, um, even if everybody else falls away, I will follow you to death. And then what did Peter do when the going got tough? He was like, nope, don't know the guy. I don't know the guy. That's a moment of distrust that Peter had. Uh, James, the brother of Jesus, in Matthew chapter 7, it tells us that, that he, along with the rest of his brothers, and he, he isn't mentioned specifically, but he is one of Jesus' brothers, didn't believe who Jesus was. But after the resurrection... All these guys saw Jesus dead after the resurrection. They saw him, they believed in him, and all three of those guys died a very painful execution-style death because they believed in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Um, it wasn't because of moments of doubt that they're remembered, it's, it's because of the fact that, on the whole, they believed God, and they proved it by their faith. The same is true, and we know this is true in Abraham's life. He grew strong in his faith. How do we know this? Because after Isaac was born, God asked him to sacrifice his only son, Isaac, the son of the promise, and Abraham was going to do it. 
and he was going to do it because he believed that either God was going to provide a way out or he was going to raise his son from the dead because he believed that God was going to keep his word. His faith had grown strong enough uh, to be willing to sacrifice even his own son. What are the characteristics of Abraham's faith and hope? I want to point you out to one thing in particular. It says that he gave glory to God as his faith grew strong. He gave glory to God. This is in stark contrast in book ends chapter one through four. In chapter one, verse 21, it's, you know, it's talking about all the people who have seen all the evidence of God, what did they do? Although they knew God in Romans 1, 21, although they knew God, they did not glorify him or give him thanks. Here, Abraham recognized who God was and gave him thanks for what he had done. Verse 23, um, we thankfully, verse 23, Romans, in Romans, Paul is making, um, making this bring it home to you. All right? It's not just what happened to Abraham, and can we be certain? It's like, what do you actually believe? Where is your hope? But the words, verse 23, it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. Paul lumps himself into that. It will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead, Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. And so now it's, it's decision point in, in Paul's mind. He's convincingly argued that you cannot save yourself. You are not righteous. You need someone else. There is hope because Jesus has done like that, done that for you. There are very few, if any, passages in the Bible that so succinctly show us exactly our problem and the solution, right? All right. It, it tells us that we're a sinner, right? It will be counted to us who believe in him, what will be counted? Back in verse 22, it was the righteousness that was counted to Abraham. That's important, why? Because remember, reason number five from earlier, like only, only the righteous have hope, and so we need righteousness, and right here it's telling us it can, can be counted to you as well. You can have God's righteousness, and so therefore you can die with hope. It will be counted us, and how do you get that hope? It'll be counted to us who believe in what and who? In him. In him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses, you have a problem, it's sin. You needed somebody to die for it because that is the penalty for sin. He was delivered up, Jesus was delivered up for our trespasses. He was delivered up for your wickedness and he was raised for your justification. He didn't just stay dead, he rose again, and now he has the ability to give you his righteousness. How do you get it? How do you get it? You believe. You believe. That is the only way. What assures us that this hope, that, like, it, that seems so good, too good to be true, right? Like, you just have to believe, and then you get God's righteousness. What is it that assures us that our hope is well-grounded? Ephesians 1, 12 to 14 tells us this. So, we, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. I want you to notice a few things in this verse. First, I want you to notice the, the mention of the Holy Spirit there in verse 13. What is the Holy Spirit called? What does the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit seals. The Holy Spirit seal. You're sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit. And what is the Holy Spirit called? And what does he do when he seals? He guarantees. If you're sealed with the Holy Spirit, it's a guarantee. Now let me ask you a question. Who in here can break a seal of God? Nobody. There's nobody that can break the seal of God. And so if you have the Holy Spirit, it's permanent. You can't do anything to mess it up. You can't break it. Nobody else can break it. Satan can't break it. Nobody can break it. It's God's seal. Um, and so we know we can have a confident hope that 
God will do what he says. Second, I want you to see the mention of God's word in verse 13. When you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed him. All right, the word is something that needs to be believed. It is God's word, and God's word is certain. Why? Because God's character is unchanging. All right. And the third and final reason that we can be assured that our hope is well-grounded, I want you to notice, is, the, is God's glory. God's glory. There is no one more glorious. He is the most. He is infinitely glorious. It makes that point in verse 12. Uh, for the, the first hope in Christ might be the praise of his glory. And at the end, until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. God has eternally been concerned, and rightly so, about his own glory. He will do what glorifies him the most. It will not glorify him if you say, I believe in, 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 in him who raised Christ from the dead, or who delivered up uh, Christ for my transgressions and raised him from the dead. I believe that. And, and, and then God dropped the ball and say, yep, sorry. Um, I, did, I sent my son to die for you, but now I'm not going to actually finish your salvation. I'm not going to do what I said. No, it only brings God glory if he does what he says he's going to do. And God always does what he says he's going to do. And so, as the worship team returns, stating the obvious, what ought to be our response since all these things are true? Um, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you need him. That seems to be a key ingredient. Like, that's how your hope is certain. If the Holy Spirit has sealed you until the day of redemption, how do you get the Holy Spirit? You need to believe. That's it. If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Amen. All right? That is, that, is what, that is how you get the Holy Spirit. It's that simple. Second, if you're feeling hopeless for any reason, whatever that reason might be, you're walking through life with some sort of hopelessness, what is the only sure anchor for the soul? The only sure anchor for the soul is the God of hope himself. Is the God of hope himself. And again, belief is key. If you're struggling with assurance of God's promises, what is the solution to help you become more sure of his promises? Well, you got to read about it. Read his word and ask the Holy Spirit to help you understand it and give you assurance of his promises because his promises are already in his word. You already have what you need to know what God promises. And so spend time reading his word daily. And fourth, if you're struggling to believe and understand what you've read, remember that God will do what glorifies him the most. God will do what glorifies him the most. You can count on that. The question is, as Paul asks in here, well, he doesn't ask, but he, uh, he assumes, the, but the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. In other words, do you believe? Where is your hope? Do you believe the promises of God? Let's pray. Father, I pray uh, that you would fill our church, our body with hope that we would believe the words that you say because of your unchanging character. I pray that each person that leaves here today will leave with hope. If they didn't have it when they came, that they will leave with it. And those who have, have hope, that their hope will be strengthened, that we will know that it's certain that you alone can save. And you will. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, thanks so much for watching online. I hope that this message has inspired you to greater faith, has encouraged you, maybe convicted or challenged you. We're grateful to be able to provide this content to you online, live and on demand. If you haven't done so already, follow us on Instagram, like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube so that we can get this content right to you as soon as we upload it. But you know, we believe that as a follower of Jesus Christ, that you need the body of Christ. You need the local church. And so if you're in the Quad Cities, let me invite you to personally join us in person for our gatherings on Sundays at 9 a.m. and 1040. If you're not in the Quad Cities, I want to encourage you to go find a local church that teaches the Bible, that serves the community, that loves Jesus, that gives grace. Well, hey, thanks again for watching, and we hope that you were blessed.